Bibles in and turn into your Bibles uh, to uh, Acts 2, verses uh, 41. We want to uh, read the church and its growth. Because in our day and time, we're seeing a lot of decline in churches in general, and we need to grow. And I was thinking we need to look to the New Testament, look to the first century, and see how they grew and how we are to grow as we come. Acts 2, beginning with verse 41, where I read the Word of God. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe or fear at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. A pastor was talking to a member of the church who did not attend church. When the pastor urged the men to come, he replied rather smugly, that he could just be just as good a Christian staying at home as he could attending church. The two men happened to be sitting right beside a fireplace with a coal uh, burning, uh, fire was burning. And the pastor just reached in with the tongs, took one of the coals out, and set it on the harp, and they continued talking. And as uh, they were talking and all, he, uh, the single coal, which had been fiery uh, red when it was in the bed of the burning coals, began to turn gray and began to cool off. Soon it lost all of its uh, cool, uh, warmth and all of its glow. Then, without saying a word, the pastor took the tongues and put it back in to the burning coals, and they went on talking. The pastor uh, picked up coal and uh, placed it in, and soon it was aglow and began to give off heat once more. The silent little drummer drove the message home, and the delinquent church member dropped his head in shame and said, Pastor, I will be in church Sunday morning. You know, I've heard many people say, well, I can be a good Christian on the lake, at the golf course, or at home, or wherever, and everything else. No, you can't. Because the word of the Hebrew says that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some are. If we are going to grow as a Christian, we need one another. And we need the corporate uh, fellowship that comes from meeting and joining together. And we need that. And a lot has lost that or is missing that during uh, these pandemics that we're having. But the Word of God says, do not, it's a command, forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a man of God. Summer. We need each other. We need each other. Nothing in the world is a personal and intimate as one's encounter with Jesus Christ. And it needs to be kept aglow, just as a coal that was turned gray and cooling off and everything else, when it was put back into the fireplace, it began to grow again and began to give off heat. That is how we are as Christians. If we try to live a Christ-like life by ourselves, we're going to be defeated because Satan is stronger than any one of us. We need each other. One cord can be easily broken. Two cords, harder. Three cords can hardly be broken. And we need to realize we need one another as we come. And it is God's will that a Christian continue and that he or she lives a Christian, does not live the Christian life in isolation. It was God's plan from the very beginning that believers in the Lord Jesus Christ be joined together in spiritual fellowship and special kind of oneness that only we can. How many times have I heard in uh, my ministry that people say when they're going through uh, trials and tribulations or deaths in their family 
I just don't see how people can go through this by themselves. Or how people can uh, deal with this without knowing the Lord as our personal Lord and Savior. Because when we know the Lord as our personal Lord and Savior, we are never alone. We are never by ourselves. We do not have to go through anything by ourselves because we have other Christians and we have our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that is with us at all times. It was God's plan from the very beginning that believers in the Lord Jesus Christ be joined together in spiritual fellowship and in spiritual worship and oneness together. On the eve of the day of Pentecost, we heard that the disciples in Acts 2-1 were all with one accord in one place. One accord, they were worshiping God. And they were in one place, together worshiping God. Just a warmth and fellowship exist in the togetherness of the church, so does growth happen in that type of environment. We grow, we get excited. We fellowship with one another and we see that we are not long ranger Christians. That we have other brothers and sisters that will encourage us and lift us up and be there for us when in our time of need. And we don't have to go through things by ourselves. Some of the most depressed people and some of those that are looking towards suicide comes to the point that they think nobody cares and there's no hope to keep going. But when we have people and we know that somebody cares about us and somebody cares about what's happening to us, we can continue on. We can find strength as we look for one another. Today we will see how the church grew in the first century. First, the church grew within itself. Acts 2, 41 and 42 says, Those who accepted the message were baptized, and 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Here we see four fundamentals of Christian growth. They were baptized. After they accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, they followed the Lord in the ordinance of baptism. Baptism does not save you, but baptism is a part of obedience to Christ when we accept Him as our personal Lord and Savior. It was our way of telling the whole world that they had begun a lifelong experience of death to self in order that they might come alive and live daily for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It unites us because we are a body of baptized believers who have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior and we have symbolically showed everybody that was there that we have died to ourselves, we were buried with Christ, and we rose to live, to live, to live a life that is pleasing to Him and be obedient to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ all the time. Secondly, they were baptized, they were taught. They continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrines. This was spiritual nourishment, food for the soul of these young believers, and they absorbed the teachings of the Word of God into their lives. It was our substance and their strength. The results were that they grew numer numerically and spiritually. We are to hide God's Word in our hearts that we might not sin against God. And if you do not know the Word of God, Satan has already won. Because you cannot remain faithful in your life unless you are obedient to studying and hiding God's Word in our hearts. The world that we live in today seeks to deceive us. Have you ever heard people say, the Bible says, and when you find out the Bible doesn't say that. They said it, and they said it because somebody else said it. And I've heard them many times that people say, the Bible said, when you start looking, no, it didn't. Or have you ever had somebody say to you, well, that's not what it meant. I'm one, if the Bible says it, it means it. And we are to live by it and obey it, whatever. Because I am not smart enough to know, well, I can take this part and that part and the other part, and I can throw away the others. The Bible is God's Word from beginning to end. Amen. And we need to be obedient to it 
no matter what. And when the Holy Spirit lives within us and we study the Word of God, the, Word, uh, the Holy Spirit will give us the right words to say at the right time. But if we do not study the Word of God, if we do not hide God's Word in our hearts as our personal Lord and Savior, then we are at a loss when things come up. You know. We need to study the Word of God. We need to be taught the Word of God. Then thirdly, we need to experience fellowship. Fellowship is coined the, uh, the Greek word. It's more than just a social get-together. It's more than a get-together like this. It describes a communion, a sharing between those who have something special in common with them. And that is, we have Jesus Christ that is, unites us. That is our unifying factor. We are under the headship of Jesus Christ. Because of the Spirit of Christ within us, the early believers began to love one another and share their burdens with one another, and they began to pray together. They had a delightful sense of community, of belonging to one another. The early Christians also, fourthly, they prayed together. This was their lifeline. Their contact with the very throne of grace itself is their prayer life, their communion, their talking, their fellowship with Almighty God. They practice what Paul expressed in Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. We are to be in an attitude of prayer at all times. We are to be, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, can uh, throw up and uh, talk to God, whatever we're doing now. We need to be such in such a communion with Him that we can talk to Him uh, at all times and know that He's there. They knew what it meant to remain in the spirit of prayer and a spirit of openness to God. So, the early church, they grew from within. Because of prayer, of Bible study, of fellowship, of communion with one another. And secondly, in Acts 2, 43-47, we have an indication of the growth of the early church that grew without itself. Not just within its four walls, but it expanded out without the four walls. That is the radiating effect of the church on the unbelieving world. We ought to make a difference to the uh, lives of those outside of the church. Our, they ought to look at us and see the Christ that lives within us. And here, as they are living right here, we see they had a fear or an awe came upon every soul. Why? Because unbelievers were looking at and seeing how believers lived. And they lived according to the Word of God. And they had a fear and awe of what was going on in their lives as they went. And verse 43, uh, Verse 43, it says unto us uh, as we come that we are to fellowship with God. We are everything, everyone was filled with awe, with fear at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. The people were watching what was happening and they were in fear and awe of what was happening there. A reverence and respect for these Christians and their faith struck at the heart of the unbelievers. They took notice that these had been with God. That these people had been with God. And thus, they grew in fellowship. They grew in prayer and openness to God as they lived. And the Holy Spirit was convicting unbelievers, even though some did not respond. Why? Because they were watching Christians. If somebody watched you, would they see and recognize a Christ that lives within you? They were seeing these um, believers living in obedience to God. And they were seeing the results. Miracles and things were happening and they took notice that these people had been with God and they became interested and they accepted God, uh, Christ, as our personal Lord and Savior uh, as they came. 
These, yet these Christians were, as verse 47 8 says, they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Even unbelievers were taking notice that they had been with God and was glorifying God themselves. The first century Christians were held in high regard by the, all, all people, even the unbelievers, because they were what they said they were. They were Christ-like people. They, they were obedient to the Word of God. They were believers that put their faith in God and they lived in obedience to God and people sit up and took notice that they had been with God. Growth without took place because the people within the church stood eyes, uh, continued steadfastly in teaching and fellowship. So the church grew from within you. Through fellowship, through praying, through uh, worship together, through studying and Bible study and praying, studying the Word of God, they grew within the church. But it did not stay within the church. They spread out and unbelievers began to take notice. Something is different about these people. And they liked what they saw. And thus, they uh, accepted Christ as our personal Lord and uh, Savior as they had. And that, uh, because the people didn't just say they were Christians, they lived the Christian life. They continued steadfastly in their teachings and fellowship and obedience to God. Then, thirdly, they grew beyond the church. They grew beyond the church. Acts 44, verse 31 and 32, it says, And they prayed, and the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly, and all the believers were one in heart and mind. Great things were happening in Jerusalem. There was uh, no denying it. It was being happened overt, uh, overtly. Out miracles were happening. People were getting saved. People were added, being added uh, daily uh, to the flock that they had and all. And they took notice uh, that they had been with God. Great things were happening within Jerusalem. Yet they could not keep the gospel within Jerusalem or within the early church. God began to prepare them for growth beyond the church. It began where they were at. It began in the church. It began in the community. And then it started spreading out into the uttermost parts of the world. Just as we have that commission uh, to do today. God began to prepare the church for growth. But in a very strange way, in a way that we would not anticipate and that we do not want. He pre uh, began preparation by letting them undergo persecution. Undergo persecution. You know, it's sad to say we are having some of the third world countries sending missionaries to the United States now. Where I had one missionary one time, was they, I was reading about it, and they were ta uh, talking to missionaries from third world countries. And they were talking about how they hated the persecution uh, that these people were going through, but admired their faith, their conviction, and uh, their obedience to the Word of God. And they said the th uh, p uh, missionaries from the third world looked at them and said, we pray for you because you are not persecuted and you don't know what thankfulness is all about. You do not know what commitment is all about. And we pray for you as we come today that you may find out what true faithfulness is all about. And they said, as they were talking, they said, a lot of this you cannot experience unless you experience persecution for your faith and your commitment in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm afraid that the United States is beginning the process of finding out that whether we are faithful or not, 
because of persecution? Are we going to stand on the solid foundation of the Word of God? Or are we going to back down and keep quiet? Because the world is saying good, evil is good, and good is evil nowadays. But are we willing to stand on the solid foundation of the Word of God and say, the Bible says this? Oh, it doesn't mean that. Yes, it does. <coughs> oh, that, uh, that's not what the Bible says. Or they will tell you what the Bible says. And if we know what it says, we can say yes or no. And we can stand on the foundation. We need to make decisions now. If we are going to be willing to stand on the Word of God. Because if you don't make that decision, we never know in reality until we come to that point. But we need to make that decision now. Instead of waiting to the time we're under persecution. And as those uh, 20 Coptic Christians or 19 Coptic Christians, wait, if you wait until a machete is behind your back or somebody's got a gun pointed to your head, or do you uh, receive your faith in Christ? You can live. But if you continue your faith in Christ, you're going to die. What would you do? You know, I've said this many a time, told you, in that group of 20, 19 were Coptic Christians. And all 19 of them died that day. It was one that had just got caught up with them when they were being arrested. And that one, that last one, said, I want the Christ that they had. And I believe in the Christ that they believed in. And he died on that uh, beach well, along with the other Christians. What about us today? Are we willing to live for Jesus Christ above all else and follow him in everything that we do and say? When the early believers began to experience hostility and pressure from the unbelieving world, what did they do? They prayed. And the church prayed, something happened. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the Word of God boldly. They experienced a physical sense of God's overpowering presence among them. God was going to use the believers to shape Jerusalem and the world through the message that these Christians were preaching in the first century. Then they spoke God's word boldly. The message of Jesus Christ and his resurrection brings new life following, uh, flowing from a living Christ into a dying people to empower the people to proclaim the resurrection with power and with authority. God had made provisions that Christians of every age can speak his word with boldness and in doing so they can shape the structure of society that we live in and, uh, as we live. As in the early church, so in our day and time, we must not uh, be ashamed to confess Christ before other people. No matter what the circumstances are, we must confess Christ before others. His word must be faithful and consistently taught or else no inner growth can take place. A quality of fellowship, a communion and oneness must exist among the people of God. Believers must pray continually for holy boldness to proclaim the good news of salvation to the very end of the earth. And we must be willing to do that. As individuals, as a church, we must make up our minds that we are going to be obedient to the Word of God no matter what anybody else says or does. And then we must trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for He has told us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will always be with you. And we need to determine I would rather please God than I had man at any time. Because we have to make that decision. Are we going to please the direction the world is going in? Or are we going to stand faithful and please our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? We must decide that. Not when that time comes. Not if some uh, people come through that door right now with guns. 
and says, do you believe in Jesus Christ? If you will not rescind your faith, you're going to die. 